So thank you for coming today. I'm very excited to share our work on the fundamentals of biochemistry, which is an upper division biochemistry OER resource housed on Libra texts. And my name is Patty Flatt, and I'm a chemistry professor at Western Oregon University, which is a small PUI institution in the Mid Willamette Valley in Oregon. And I was recruited a few years back now by Del Mar to work on this textbook project and joined forces with Henry Jakubowski, who's been the lead faculty on the OER and has been a great mentor for me on the project. So I'd like to send a shout out to him for all his help on this project. Um, so together, we really wanted to create a biochemistry OER resource that had the depth and the details to really support a year-long upper division biochemistry course, and of course, be free for students to use and access. And so one of the newest features of our textbook is that it's now searchable so that you can locate specific topics that you're interested in learning about. And so this is a, a really cool addition that we've just added. Um, so our textbook is has four major volumes that break down the major areas of focus in a traditional upper division biochemistry course. So in addition to these traditional topics, we also have a special topics component within the last section. And that is really exciting for us as it looks at cutting edge research and connection to real world topics, which can be really fun for students to learn about. So the most recent one is the intersection of biochemistry and climate change. So we really encourage you to come and take a deeper look at this textbook. So if I could have slide two. All right, so we've written this textbook to really be a living document that can be continually updated and modified as the field continues to learn more and more about the details of living systems. So we've tried to be um, really support the interdisciplinary nature of biochemistry, uh, trying to approach topics from both a biological and a chemical perspective to help support different ways of student learning. And truthfully, this field also extends to other disciplines such as mathematics, computer science, and physics. So maybe we really need the compound lens of a fly eye <laughs> on this slide to see all the dimensions. So to this end, we've incorporated a lot of dynamic content with interactive graphics to help students study concepts such as enzyme kinetics, or links to things like uh, the ICN 3D protein models so that students can twist and turn proteins and other macromolecules to get a better look at the active site structures and its stereochemistry. So we're now in the phase of developing ancillary materials for the textbook, including problem sets and case studies. So if I could have slide three. So just for a little more breakdown, the first volume focuses on the structure and function of the major macromolecules with a special emphasis on proteins and enzyme function. But you can also see we've got carbohydrates, lipids, and DNA structures in this section as well. And slide four. Our second module is an in-depth look at the cellular bioenergetics and metabolism with a focus on carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. And we also include a look at photosynthetic pathways of plants, as well as the major macromolecule biosynthetic pathways. And slide five. So in section three, we delve into the information pathways that look at processes like DNA replication, damage and repair, as well as processes of transcription and translation. And this includes a, a look at the control of these pathways through things like gene expression and regulation. So now I'd like to pass over my talk to my colleague, Henry, to talk about some of the fun and new additions in section four. Uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, just a couple of points on what she said, that search function I think is really important because this is a pretty expansive set of volumes. And so I personally use the search function all the time uh, to find material that's in there because it is so big. Um, so section four, the, the advantage of having an online text that you can constantly update is to put in material that's not found in other sources uh, and not found well. 
or not found at all. So this is, we decided to create uh, this volume four and it has uh, basically bile signaling and integration of metabolism capstones. Almost all biochem textbooks, typically at the end of the course, have a, a whole section on how to integrate mammalian metabolism. So we've done this here by incorporating lots of papers, actually, actual manuscripts to address that topic. Bio signaling is often interspersed throughout the text, but it's such a big and actually, it's like a capstone topic in itself. So the idea of moving it here, because it requires knowledge of proteins, enzymes, uh, uh, and regulation, that it, this is a good place for it. This section also allows us to do add interesting things that you wouldn't find in most normal texts. So for instance, abiotic origins of life, uh, quantum biochemistry, which I have to say it's not populated yet. <laughs> We're hoping somebody will, and eventually it will get populated. I want to talk a little bit about this one, which I've actually been working on pretty um, hard for the last maybe three or four months. Uh, so the advantage of this text, again, is that we can add what we wish. So I've um, I've become a climate activist, and so we have biochemistry and climate change. And there's a whole series of sections that cover the basics, the applied, and the more deeper biochemical sort of uh, issues. So I just wanted to just talk about a little bit about what's embedded in this chapter without even going to it. Uh, I, I think it was important to give people the basics. And so the first three sections have actually maybe less biochemistry than you would ordinarily find, but it allows you to understand how we know climate change is occurring. Uh, and that includes section two, which does a lot of analysis of isotope use, which are which are used historically a lot in, in biochemistry. So it's one more step to talk about them uh, and apply their use to looking at how we know information from the past in terms of CO2 and temperature uh, data. Uh, and finally, carbon cycle. And a lot of this stuff is not found in traditional books, but the carbon cycle is, is such an important feature. Looking at fluxes of CO2 going into the earth, CO2 being emitted, uh, and treating those mathematically as well. So these are really important introductory parts to this, to this uh, chapter. Now we've added more biochemical content uh, to this as well. So for instance, there's a chapter on biohydrogen, hydrogenases, which, which really are applied chapter sections based on what students learn in earlier sections. Uh, there's two sections that directly have to do with temperature. So what effect is there on temperature on chemical reactions? Now um, we've all students have studied this in intro chemistry, certainly physical chemistry, but this sort of summarizes uh, the basics of what we know and apply to biological reactions. And then finally, uh, temperature effects on proteins, which are obviously hugely important as within a warming world. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is turn to some of the interactive features that are present in the book that Patty mentioned. And in doing so, I'm going to actually go to some links. Uh, one of the interactive features we have are simply interactive graphs. Uh, and we think these are really important instead of showing just static graphs, you can actually change sliders and see the effect in real time on, uh, on the uh, output graphs. So for instance, I'm going to go to this chapter, hopefully it will allow me to do it, where one of these uh, interactive graphs is found. And we're gonna step up and we're gonna see some more complicated things. I'm gonna scroll through this. The idea is not to, for you to read all this. There's plenty of uh, just static graphs in here. But uh, this is the first one I wanted to show you. It's a graph that just simply shows time courses for a simple reactant going to product in the absence of an enzyme. Uh, and you know, I have written the equations for, for the velocity of the reaction, which people should write. I don't expect anyone would necessarily know how to, create, how to uh, integrate these and come up with the solutions. But you know, there are static graphs here that shows for various rate constants for the forward and reverse reaction, what the graphs would look like. But with these interactive graphs, the students can change in real time uh, the rate constant for the forward and backward reaction. And actually, this is a great activity that you could do in class because I've done this numerable times when I was teaching. By the way, I'm an emeritus professor of chemistry at the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University. I've been retired now since COVID hit uh, 2020. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you ask a student 
for a simple A going to P reversible reaction, for them to draw a graph of what it would look like, it's amazing what you would get. And then they can actually interrogate the graph online with different rate constants. Uh, in addition, we have some animations built into this that actually show pictorially what will happen. Uh, these were developed by uh, Janet Owasso in the University of Utah, and this shows also graphically and sort of pictorially uh, the simple reaction of uh, first order process going from uh, A to the P and then the reverse reaction also first order, in this case when the rate constants are constant. So we've tried to provide a variety of uh, learning opportunities within interactive, uh, within the interactive graphs. So now let me go back to the power, PowerPoint here. Okay. Uh, so the next interactive feature we have are, I'm going to get rid of this because I can't see it, intermolecular molecular, uh, interactive uh, molecular models using ICM3D. Uh, if you're familiar with modeling on the web, a lot of people will use JSMO. I've used all kinds of programs in the past, but we've opted for this because of its ease of use and the ease of which students could use it. So I just have a couple here. There's over probably close to 600 of these models that have been embedded. They use PDB coordinates. They use online software. They use JavaScript. You don't have to really know how to do anything, but it's easy to embed. Uh, and for instance, here's an example. It's just a, uh, a domain of a protein that's partly embedded into the membrane. So it's not an integral membrane protein, but it's sort of a peripheral protein. Um, and when going to this, you can... This will take us to the chapter, and the chapter is on membrane proteins. I'm going to quickly scroll down. Apparently, I was editing this this morning and didn't save it. Um, but we can scroll down um, and see this model that's embedded. Uh, I'm going to save this first before I go ahead, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to screw it up anyway. But I again, there's over almost 600 of these embedded. I can click on this model within directly within the chapter and the pop-up pops up in which you get essentially the same model that we just saw before. You can interrogate it. There's a full menu that you can change its rendering. Uh, what I like about the software, this, this dummy red line and blue spheres represent the bilayer. And you can tell this protein is partly embedded through these nonpolar side chains from this particular uh, protein domain. So, and on top of that, I have embedded links that go to the full model, which is it's a web-based model uh, through a program I see in 3D. I can see in 3D, developed through the NIH. Uh, and again, you can interrogate this. People could literally change the rendering. Students can change the rendering by uh, looking at some of these models. And for instance, if I want to change uh, let's see, there's some glob residues there. If I want to style them differently, I could do make them spheres. See, I can change the rendering on this and again, ask students a lot of questions. So I won't necessarily bother showing you the next model. It's a little redundant. But the fact of the matter is there's over um, close to 600 of these things now. This is just a static model showing cation pi stacking in a protein in the chapter that has to do with non-covalent interactions. Now, the next, um, I'm going to move this up again. So we have these interactive graphs, but we have more complicated ones as well that uh, are, were not so easy to create using the software that we use to embed these simple graphs. These models down here, and this is a specific example, was used was created using a program called vCell in which you create a model. In this particular model, I'll just walk through it brick, briefly. There's a protein up here that gets phos phosphorylated. When it gets phosphorylated, it phosphorylates a downstream protein, not once, but twice to make an active protein. That protein, doubly phosphorylated, can come back and phosphorylate a protein further down in this cascade, not once, but twice to make an active protein. And then when that happens, this protein is active, but you know, you gotta have a way to shut it off. It turns out this protein itself can phosphorylate on the proteins. It comes back, phosphorylates this very first protein in this cascade and shuts it off. So this is a very complex model, nothing compared to the stuff that we're gonna see in a minute, however. Uh, and the students have an ability now 
uh, because we've embedded about 10 of these more complex, actually some simple and more complex models into the book. I'm going to show you this one. It's in the signal transduction cascade chapter, uh, chapter 28.4. And we're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom here. So don't mind all the scrolling here. Um, it's a very, very big book. And here it is right here. Uh, so here's the same model we just saw before. And what we're going to do is we, we can run this model using V cell, which basically solves a bunch of ordinary differential equations numerically, and you get an output, graphical output. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, we're going to run this simulation, um, and it'll pop up very quickly, and there's the output. And you can see mm -hmm. oscillatory behavior, mm -hmm. something you could never predict, first of all, uh, from this more complex model. Uh, and you can change the constants. So you can change the parameters here and change the constants, uh, specifically uh, some of the maximum velocity constants and things like that, uh, and change the output. So this really adds a level of interactivity which is not possible uh, years ago. And if we want to see the same graphical output without this feedback inhibition to see what it would look like, we can do that quickly. Of course, that could have been done here, down here as well, but there you go. No more oscillatory behavior. So uh, this actually allows us um, to be able to do some really cool time courses for both simple enzyme kinetic and transport phenomena and more complex signal trans uh, transduction uh, cascades. So now I'm going to turn the, uh, the talk over to Bartholomew, who is, whoops, it is, who is added Oh my God, something phenomenal and just in the past week. So we'll spend a little time talking about that and then we'll entertain questions. Okay, hi, my name is Bart Jardine and I work with Herbert Sauro at the University of Washington in the bioengineering department. And I've been talking to Herbert and uh, uh, Henry and Delmar about our um, simulator, online simulator. And we're hoping to got it the basic idea working now on LibreText, but there's still some file uh, permission stuff I need to address. But anyway, I'll briefly show you how it works. Um, it's a it's as it's a client side JavaScript JavaScript based simulator, and it does time course models, and it helps to uh, show key concepts because the user can interact with the model itself. And it makes use of, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the systems biology markup language, but the models are written in that. And there's a wealth of models in the systems biology community that make use of this standard for reproducibility of the models. Um, and so, hey, Henry, can we go to the, the yes. site? Yeah. Yes, let's, let's do can that. Can I share uh, or drive it? Uh, let me go quickly. It'll take a second here. Somehow I had a lick in there, but I don't know if the link's there anymore. So this will take me a second to get to where we want to go. Um, so let's go here. But I'll try to we'll just quickly show you the how it works and how the user can interact with it. So this is in section four. It's in the signaling transduction chapter. So we're going to go to biosignaling here, and it's the section on calcium signaling. So um, we're going to go to calcium signaling, and then I'm going to scroll to the very bottom of this. Yeah. Where where we have it. Yeah. And you, okay. Yeah. So up at the top, this is this is a uh, model peer reviewed paper model from uh, Goldbitter in 1990. The details aren't quite important, but it's about calcium signaling and how it is controlled in the oscillate oscillations. And, but if you go down then, we'll have the equations and then and basically it's two ODs and we have a bunch of parameters that change the, change the values of the species, the concentration of cytosolic calcium and that which is also stored in, in a pool. So in our simulation, which is embedded here, if you hit the start button, it'll immediately print it do it. And it'll show the oscillatory nature of the calcium concentrations 
in between the cytosolic and that which is stored in the pool. And then on the bottom, we have these sliders that are, you can adjust the parameters and move them as needed, and it'll immediately show the effect of, of those parameters on the, on the concentrations being graphed. So the user can then explore this stuff and see the relationships themselves, how, how it is affected. And then the, the, the people who are writing can ask questions and then the user can just go and investigate it. And right now, it, this um, simulator is pretty responsive and it, it works pretty well so far. We've been pretty happy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, look at, I'm highlighting two of these values n, the Hill function cooperativity coefficient. We talk about these in classes and students struggle with them. Like, why, what did they mean? Uh, to be able to, what's their value? And they're incorporated into a lot of signal transduction models because they give you really exquisite control of yeah. what the output looks like for under a variety of circumstances. So to have this in here for the students to be able to do this in real time is really quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that's your basic idea about this. And yeah. we're obviously adding more, more um, features as requested, hopefully, and as needed. And so we're open to suggestions on things that will be needed to be included. And the earlier models I had, I made those within vCell, but my skill level is not it's not possible for me to make really complex models. Mm -hmm. And having these pre-made in, in a data bank where you can just pluck them out, the systems biology markup language files and plug them in here is amazing. I, I, I've looked at these there. You can simulate everything in glycolysis if you like. You can simulate the yeah. coagulation cascade. It's really amazing. And the hope is we can populate the book with a lot of these uh, in the next bit of time. Yeah, I think that the, um, if you go down, scroll down a little bit further, there's a reference to in Europe, they have, oh, they're right above the interactive element. This EBI biomodels is uh, in UK. If you go there, they have lots of um, uh, biomodels. And it's, this is, this is the reference to the particular one, but at the homepage, they have like a thousand that are um, curated and maybe five or 600 that are being added. Uh, and these all should have be in SBML format. So there's a lot of different software that can run and visualize and you can investigate it as well as the one I just showed you. Yeah, and this is really a phenomenal resource. Yeah. Yeah, vCell and Telerium, like you said, are all SBML. They support SBML. Yeah. Well, I yeah. guess that's it for now. If there's any questions or just dialogue in general. I'd like to just say one thing. You know, we've written section three, information pathways. But I think there's a dirty uh, secret amongst biochemistry educators that hardly anybody gets to these. You know, I, and you talk to people and I never I never do this. But the resource is here. And the book is so comprehensive. The idea is you can choose what you want and create your own book. That's the value of the LibreText. It's impressive what you guys have done. Um, if I remember, it was like 3,200 pages. If, if we, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, I, I, I took two quarters of biochemistry at UW. Um, Pearson, I think was his name, Bob Pearson, Jim Pearson. He was a plant, uh, plant guy. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean, I wasn't overwhelmed by, by the material, but it was just basically the, the, the thickness of the book and, and such was really quite, uh, impressive off of here. So, uh, I, I'm very excited uh, that, that you guys have uh, pulled this together. I'm also very excited about the new technology, uh, yeah. circling back to UW, uh, at least for me. Um, the uh, I was actually a little bit more interested in taking you know the new technology that Bart has, uh, has mentioned here and, and mm -hmm. ask you know what the type of questions that people would would ask 
um, out there for. So, you know, my brain uh, goes back to super simple stuff like Michaelis Menten uh, mm -hmm. Bayes question. So it's like, okay, well, here is the, the, I guess it's just a single differential equation. Uh, and here are a couple parameters that you're using or to play around with. Um, and then being able to, to recognize how V max changes as a function of concentration or a few of the other things. So you can sort of make this somewhat um, guided inquiry uh, based, like here's the differential equation. And then what do you expect for the, the velocity as you start to scale this thing up and then explain it uh, type of thing. Uh, are there any other uh, types of approaches that you can envision off of there? Are there any needs in order to be able to have some sort of uh, API endpoint that might be useful in order to couple into like adapt homework system uh, in order to check out like have them simulate Ooh. something and say, what is the final value for this thing? And check to see if that's actually truly the final value. Uh, I'm still quite open uh, or it's unclear in my head exactly how that works, partially because I don't teach the the, the material. Um, yeah, there, so you're saying what, what else, what type of uh, more inputs might be needed to help the, the well, students to interact? Like, yeah, I, Right now, like this particular model, you cannot change the starting point, starting values for the concentrations of the uh, species. Um, so maybe changing, having the ability to change that. Um, but um, is that just is that coding on your side, or is that something more? Uh, um, that would be more just coding on my side. Okay, it's pretty it should be straightforward. Yeah. Or, straightforward yeah i guess i'm trying to figure out is when you teach these things what what would be the generic what would you ask people to do so i'm thinking you know when i teach my chemistry stuff or so i i would have them you know write the differential equations down solve the differential equations which obviously in this case here would be quite painful <laughs> if at all um but let's say would you ask them to go to the database and find the model that would be most applicable? Uh, would you give them the model and then have them just play with the parameters? Would that be all that you're limited with? I'm trying to think about how expansive you can be. Yeah, um, usually, um, well, when you're doing a Michaelis Menten, you can always say um, you would maybe give them the full backward forward rate constant equation as well and say, well, what are the situations where Michaelis Menten is, is a valid approximation to the real reaction rates and they'll find out about whether the concentration on uh, you know when it gets the um, what do you call it the product concentration is smaller than the initial or whatever um so there might be some comparison stuff like that thinking about it in terms of that um Okay, so that's still a little bit Socratic uh, method. So you can yeah. you can model a, a, you can more accurately model reality when you have all the parameters here, and then start to apply uh, given the simple model and have them play with it and see how does it actually compare to the real model the what you'd or, experimentally measure quote unquote. Um, yeah, and also fundamentally, uh, it allows the user or the student to find out well where does this model fail because yeah. It, probably allow you to change the values and say, oh, well, this thing doesn't work when the concentration is so, or the reaction rate is this speed or whatever. It'll allow them to find out, you know, when the model is valid and invalid. You know, I think that, I mean, even if you go back to first and second order reactions, so if you plot a first order reaction without an enzyme, you know, you get this decay. If you plot a second order, you get a decay. And unless you go far enough in terms of concentration of A, uh, you're not going to be able to differentiate those easily unless you do the fitting. So the idea of yeah. model fitting, I think none of none of the mathematical graphs, whether the simple, the interactive ones of these, yet have questions embedded in the text. And I think it's, it would be so easy to do that. And like I said, even on this simple one, we talk about these complicated ones, students were paralyzed when they I asked them, here's the reaction. I, mm -hmm. I didn't even give them the equation. I said, just draw A and P as a function of time. They would draw all kinds of crazy things, like one that were not stoichiometrically possible, and you get all these oscillations that would damp out. It was incredible. And then to realize that, 
And some people would draw a meeting in the center. Well, of course, that's the case that the rate constants are the same. So it's like for any one of these, one, you interrogate the model and say, is it an appropriate model? Does it fit the data? Uh, and then you have the constants. You have to, I'm, I was less worried about changing the initial concentrations, but these constants, what do they really mean? Yeah. So, and I think the same thing that applies to these SBML models applies to these simple things, to tell yeah. you the truth. And it would be nice to slowly integrate questions in there that would allow it. Again, sort of like problem solving, uh, guided learning, to get them to a point. Now, I don't know how it would interface with your your question and your homework system because I don't I'm not familiar with that. But that's a deficit in the book. There's no fundamentally solid questions embedded. Just haven't had time. We just spent all our time on content development. You know. Yeah, uh, Henry. I think a lot of this discussion goes down to the question, goes back to the question of why pH is used. And the reason it's used is that Arnold Beekman invented a one, two microvolt amplifier back in 1930 or so that directly read out in, PA, in the log of the hydrogen atom concentration, hydrogen ion concentration. And Michaelis Menten is the same kind of question. Why do we use it? Because you can do it pencil and paper. Yeah. And it's it's if you really think about it, we now have the computational yeah. capacity yeah. to interact with these things directly. Right. Right. So and, yeah, I think I agree. I think that these time courses are more intuitive than Michaelis Menten. Because, you know, I mean, you got this initial velocity of people struggle with what does that mean? Because that's a derivative when time t, when you know, t equals zero, this curve. And then it's like versus s. And, it, and it's like, in, in a trivial way, it's like understanding density. It's hard for a young person to understand where well, you got different mass groups and volume, but you have the same density. Uh, just a versus time. And I think with the computational analysis, it's defect. It's so deficient in other texts. That's what I think is so powerful about ours that it's in there, and it's used in support of Michaela Smetton, not standing alone without it. So, yeah. yeah. Nice, really nice. It almost makes me want to go back and teach biochemistry. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll just stick with chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, I have a, a, a great interest in capitalizing on uh, this new technology and integrating it into ADAPT, because uh, I think that it could be very beneficial as a learning uh, infrastructure in order to manipulate um, uh, these things. It, 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 my issue is it's not quite so obvious what the questions are besides mm -hmm. fiddling with uh, with rate constants and identifying applicability of of of, of approximations or, or or terminal behavior or initial behavior, if that's actually possible too, for simple things like, you know, uh, like the McKay's mentioned equation or single single or to uh, ODE based stuff. Um, but even if you're able to go in there and introduce like the BZ reaction, which I, I presume is relatively simple uh, to implement within uh, this thing. Now I can actually introduce that uh, constructively without destroying a whole lecture on what BZ uh, and trying to draw the BZ reaction <laughs> and what the, what it actually means and all the things like that that that, that comes yeah. from it. So there's a uh, there's really a lot of cool stuff here. I'm I'm very excited about it. Me too. Yeah. I still am after all these years. Still excited about it. <laughs> Sounds groovy. Well, like I mentioned before, uh, it's four volumes because uh, that's the only way in order you could get physical copies of this book. Uh, otherwise, uh, no physical book can make, you know, whatever, however thick it would have to be that, that's out there. Um, and because it's a... Um, because uh, it's on the Libra text, you can then slice and dice it as you uh, see fit as an instructor in order to suit your own purposes and such. I look forward in order to take this and showcasing it to uh, the biochemistry faculty uh, here uh, at UC Davis to see um, what their responses are. Yeah, right me around. too. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So, any other questions, concerns?
Well, with that, I think we can close this thing out. Um, that was a good conversation. I really enjoyed uh, what you guys presented here.